right, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the AO Trauma North America webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is on distal femur fractures. Uh, we'll talk about some of the fixation constructs that I think um, many of you all have been uh, seeing, reading about, uh, you know, exploring a little bit on your own in terms of indications and role. And so we're going to talk about uh, you know, one implant versus uh, two implants nail plates, dual plates, kind of when to use them. Uh, so my name is John Scalero uh, from the University of California Irvine Medical Center in Orange, California. I'm going to be moderating today's session. Uh, Rich Yoon with me from uh, New Jersey, as well as Chris Lee from just a little bit farther north uh, of us in Southern California here at, at UCLA. So we'll, we'll hear from each of them, and then we'll have the opportunity to gather at the end and go through some some cases. Um, some disclosure information just for um, a little bit about AO North America. Um, this is in no way, shape, or form uh, promotion of, of any use or products uh, by the AO. Uh, these are all our cases, all our all our thoughts. Um, but the AO uh, provides us an opportunity to to speak about the topic. Everyone's microphones have been muted uh, and the cameras are off. There's a Q&A box that's available to uh, enter your questions. And so please feel free to do that um, throughout the webinar. We will try to answer them uh, if we can. If not, uh, if it's a good question that we may want to pose to the entire group or, or similar, we'll try to do that um, at the very end. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, use just use a chat box uh, um, uh, or use the Q&A box uh, for anything that you have. A little bit about the webinar. Really, the objectives of this is to outline the various fixation uh, techniques for distal femur fractures, describe some of the common indications for dual plate and combined plate nail um, fixation for for distal femur fractures, and then apply um, uh, these in in challenging scenarios. Some of the scenarios that are that are not the run of the mill, straightforward distal femur fractures. And I think that's the reason that uh, there has been attention brought to uh, some of these different fixation constructs. So I'm going to go through a, a few minutes of uh, background, at least with regard to kind of where we've been and single implant fixation. Then I'm going to turn uh, hand it off to Rich Yoon to talk about uh, combined plate nail fixation. Um, Chris Lee is going to follow up with dual plate fixation, and then we have some cases at the end. I, you know, we'll see how much we get through. Uh, hopefully, the discussion is is lively, and if you all are engaged and have good questions, then this will be a lot more uh, fun for all of us and a lot more educational. Just a quick reminder, the next um, webinar will be uh, Tuesday, November 28th on pelvis. Uh, Jason Ascone uh, will be talking about uh, posterior fracture dislocations uh, of the ring. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, so what's the problem? You, you know, I, I think you look at the um, historical data with regard to distal femur fractures, ripe with um, kind of misadventures in terms of application of of implants. And, you know, it's it would not be fair to blame the implants for all the issues that we've had uh, with regard to fixing these fractures. Obviously, um, implant application, but also understanding the biologic uh, consequences of implant application, the importance of alignment. Uh, and honestly, for, for a lot of these patients who um, may have poor bone quality, multiple comorbidities, uh, there's a lot of issues that uh, that come along with with these fractures that that would really plague uh, injuries in any area, but you know, in an area of compromised uh, biology uh, and sometimes difficult biomechanics to to kind of dial in, these can become problematic. And so we see issues with um, malalignment, uh, poor healing, non-union, implant breakage, um, kind of across the across the board. Again, the you know the historical data has had complication rates anywhere upwards of of twenty percent. Um, I think some of the newer series that have come out have dropped that number uh, a little bit, and I think that's really a reflection of the fact that uh, we understand the importance of uh, avoiding uh, fixation in in varus, uh, understanding the importance of metaphyseal comminution. Um, really respecting the the biology of, of certain areas but when we're dealing with uh, some of these fractures which some of which may have very short distal segments limited opportunities for uh, fixation especially around maybe a total knee uh, arthroplasty implant that's been put in 
um, there's challenges with regard to you know, obtaining and maintaining uh, appropriate uh, fixation. In addition, um, I think as we understand the importance of mobilization for these older patients, you know, we talk about it all the time with hip fractures, and I know this will be one of the things that our, our panels will speak about. You know, it's really important to get these older patients up and mobilized, and so we need to give them a fixation construct that will uh, allow them to do that. Uh, we don't want to be, you know, taking a patient to the operating and fixing them, and then you know, holding them up in in bed for you know six, eight weeks, three months because we're waiting for things to to heal. They will, they will, their bone quality will uh, diminish really quickly. You know, if you go back to um, kind of what has been done, you know, obviously non-operative management, you know, initially before we had um, uh, fixation implants. Uh, and then, you know, as we started to uh, understand the, the benefit of fixation of fractures, you know, we had non-locking implants, but you see here the application of, of a dual uh, construct uh, for a distal femur fracture with non-locked uh, implants. And so we understood bicolumnar fixation, even at an early time point before we had fixed angle constructs. Then um, we we're using blade plates and um, condylar screws as a fixed angle implant uh, for a long period of time, uh, again, to provide some angular stability uh, to these. And that gave way to uh, locked implant technology, which I think really drove a lot of the uh, distal femur plates that we see now. Retrograde nails, uh, early retrograde nails were really not appropriate for a lot of the distal femur fractures that we're gonna be talking about, but it, again, as implants, uh, continued to develop and uh, we had increased number of locking opportunities or fixation opportunities with uh, interlocking bolts distally. I think that uh, continued to change things. And you know, now we have combined plate nail um, implants or combined plate nail constructs and dual um, fixation constructs almost that look very similar to what we were doing uh, before. But I think just again, with an understanding of the importance of, of early mobilization and, and weight bearing. As I mentioned before, I'll talk a little bit about the single implant uh, fixation constructs that are out there. Uh, I think still have have a role in 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 certain fractures, and so you know, a patient of mine who had a, a comminuted um, distal femur fracture with a you know, laterally based uh, lock plate placed percutaneously, and you see the amount of metaphyseal healing that you see um, when the medial, uh, anterior, and posterior biology is 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 respected. Um, the I think one of the challenges is that the simply just the application of a locked plate uh, did give us problems, and so it wasn't you know the plate wasn't the savior that I think we all hoped it would be, and so we we for whatever reason forget about dialing in alignment, understanding um, uh, mechanical and anatomic access. Then the plate can be applied, but we you know but we end up having uh, you know bad malreductions, which eventually lead to non-unions and, and uh, implant failure. And so um, understanding the biomechanics and, and working length when we have large areas of, of metaphyseal comminution um, can be problematic because having a laterally based implant uh, really is at a biomechanical disadvantage for a lot of these fractures when there's um, metaphyseal comminution. Retrograde instrument medullary nails, as I mentioned before, uh, the early nails did not have as many uh, interlocking bolt options distally, but I think uh, many of the newer generation nails um, demonstrate that they will cluster interlocking bolts in the distal segment, which allow them to be used. Uh, and I think many of us have seen an increased use of retrograde intramedullaries, intramedullary nails for not only extraarticular, but also simple and sometimes complex intraarticular injuries. We talk about the preservation of biology Really, the nail can be applied without the disruption to the uh, biology of the metaphysis. And one of the benefits is that as long as the stuck point is, is good, um, it usually will help align the distal segment uh, with the anatomic axis of the, of the femur. But again, not without problems. And so for some, in, some injuries, uh, especially when the um, fracture morphology is not advantageous, uh, when it's more of a shear injury, uh, sometimes we can end up having issues with regard to malalignment, uh, especially driven by the presence of a total knee arthroplasty implant, um, and sometimes in patients with poor bone quality. As I mentioned before, the use of uh, dual implants is not necessarily new, and so uh, initially shown for recalcitrant non-unions, um, for endosteal plating and dual plating, uh, 
Uh, and then for some of these more challenging fractures, again, with larger patients, uh, we started to see this in, you know, uh, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17, and 18, when people were showing case reports of medullary nails being placed with laterally based lock plates. So to, to wrap up here, I think the questions that I really want you all to consider as learners uh, and that I hope some of our panels will address is, what is, uh, when is an isolated implant um, still appropriate? And when do I need to consider using a dual implant construct? And if I am going to do that, uh, what is the order uh, in terms of um, medial plate or lateral plate or nail first or plate first um, with regard to fixation? And actually, does it really matter? And then understand some of the biologic and biomechanical considerations uh, for these types of implants. And are there scenarios uh, where the dual implant construct is not really appropriate? So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Uh, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, nail plate constructs. All right. Thanks, John. Um, I just want to make sure you guys see not presenter mode, correct? Okay. Um, and just to kind of go on this uh, evolution of what John thought about you know, the reason why we're doing all of this is to get our patients kind of up and walking as well as decreasing our failure rate. I think something that shows uh, from John's presentation is just what our mentors before us have thought about this and what we hope to continue is looking at the overall paradigm of our treatment and how we can continuously improve. And when it comes down to it is how are we going to have a, a biologically friendly mechanically stable construct that's based on our principles in order to get our patients up, reliable weight-bearing and early mobilization, especially our geriatric patients. Just to start with a little bit of biomechanical evidence, we know that with an isolated lateral locked implant, a lot of the stress concentration when you do bear weight is centered around typically the tip of the proximal part of the implant. And as you go down, uh, your mechanical axis, a lot of the stress concentration is actually centered on the lateral side. With an isolated plate, the medial side is not seen that much. The reason why a nail is favorable, and you know, I think a lot of us have gone to more and more uh, nailing if possible, is that because it's already along the anatomic axis, the load sharing across uh, the medial and lateral kind of femurs are kind of equivalent. So uh, my mentor taught me how to do this. And as a, as a kid that laid uh, cement in the Bronx, he just told me that when you make a cement sidewalk, you put rebar in it so you make it stronger. This is the way he convinced me to try these out. And this is what convinced us to write this paper where we're maintaining the neutral axis, allowing a, a reliable construct that's not isolated that you can let them walk on. And you have the stress concentration that's going to go from lateral to medial. This is something that is not indifferent. Just what Chris is going to talk about more. You know, dual plating implants achieve the same goal of getting that stress concentration from the medial over to the lateral side. So, you know, looking at our biomechanical evidence, um, this is a paper out of Tampa looking at uh, supplementing a locked implant uh, with uh, a nail alone. Looking at these four construct scenarios, you notice that just adding a secondary plate, even if it's a recon plate, survivability to the failure, adding a second implant pretty much allows you to get to a point where you're minimizing complete hardware failure. And a lot of us talk about this, you know, we're in this race to hardware failure or, or fracture healing. And it seems like this allows us to get, uh, win the race more often than not. Uh, our, our fearless moderator tonight looked at these constructs as well, published in JLT in 2020. Dual plating actually was a stiffness here. Nail plate was second. Uh, and then not surprisingly, or sometimes surprisingly, you know, the nail and the lock plate was a third and fourth. Another question we get a lot is, does linkage matter? Um, Ken Eagle out of uh, NYU looked at this biomechanical study, looked at uh, linking at two points uh, distally versus an unlinked construct and not found no significant difference in, in stiffness. Uh, one thing I did notice about this uh, study setup was that the, uh, the bolts, for some reason, that were linking were not threaded. I don't know how much a threaded implant is going to ever uh, kind of in, infer more of a biomechanical stability, but... Um, that was something that's different than what we normally use. And again, in that figure B, it looks like there is some interference fit around the nail or figure A rather, 
uh, where it, you know that also might incur some inherent inst uh, stability that we might not see. So uh, it's really about that. Uh, John again looked at um, uh, nail diameter. Um, uh, not surprisingly, here eleven is going to be stronger. But uh, for those of us who nail plate this, uh, you know. I try and go with something that's a little bit uh, thinner in diameter and width so that it's easier to get screws around it uh, as you go up to diaphysis. Clinically, there is more and more things coming out. Obviously, John went over some of the original kind of uh, non-union plate su supplementation work that is has been in the past. And, you know, there are, there are more and more things that are coming out. These reviews really didn't have that much to summarize. But really, um, looking at this study, this is published by Chris uh, in 2023, um, looking at over a thousand distal femur fractures um, to seeing if there was a protective effect. And that, that was my question. I just don't think there was enough. And maybe if we got to a big enough number, we might have actually gotten there. Um, another uh, paper um, published this year in injury, looking at lack, uh, lock plating versus nail plating. Small numbers, obviously, but everyone in that nail plate group was significantly higher weight bearing. Uh, and then no failures in non-unions comparatively. But again, another small series. Uh, Clay just has uh, his group publish a, a comparative series. Again, uh, asymmetrical comparison, but a bigger group on that on the lateral lock plate side. Uh, nail plate at a higher transfusion rate, which obviously, you know, which is not surprising, although uh, our group hasn't found that. We use a lot of TXA also. No differences in infections in each group. Uh, and then reoperation rate, you know, a lot lower failure rates here, nail plate versus lock plate. And we know in Alabama, obesity is a problem. So they probably go into dual plate, dual, uh, dual implant constructs more frequently than not. Uh, another paper put out by Chris uh, this past October, again, a similar to clay study, but with a lot more um, uh, kind of lock plate patients. Uh, propensity matched this one, which, which I think helped uh, control for the kind of mismatch there noted a, a significantly different or lower rate of failure with nail plate combo as well. So again, I think we're, we might be getting into the weeds, but I think we're learning more and more about uh, how isolated implants might not work and where we're going to use dual implants. Uh, our our, um, our multi-center study is no, not comparative. Uh, looked at about 78 of these. Similarly, we only brought one back to the OR. It was a, it was a diabetic smoker with an A1C close to nine. Um, so that, that's why the patient healed. And eventually we got them optimized and got them down and uh, got them back to heal. Um, so going on to kind of how and when, this is kind of overall uh, my philosophy for isolated uh, implants versus a combo. If the fracture morphology is simple, metaphyseal, or low transverse, you certainly can use a, a lock plate alone. I typically save it for younger folks. Um, uh, you know, the, the myths of going through the knee have since been uh, dispelled. However, uh, if I if I can just slide a mi uh, minimally invasive plate up and it's something that doesn't require a lot, uh, I will do that. I still tend to nail a lot more things uh, than plate them, uh, since we looked up our data in our registry and probably uh, an 80, 85 to fifty percent uh, nail the plater. Uh, retrograde nail for me. If there's any kind of um, taft seal zone or shaft extension that's in the middle middle half and distal, um, even with the articular involvement, that's going to be a retrograde nail. And probably my second most common use is going to be a combo, either nail plate or dual plate, where if you have medial comminution in an osteoporotic patient with a large zone of metaphyseal um, fracture site, um, for me, you need to you need something to address both sides, again, to get something uh, stressed over to that medial side. So what are my steps? I typically, uh, about 80-20, are, is a, I'm a nailer first. Again, uh, radialist and flat table. Uh, sterile bump under the under the ipsilateral uh, ischial tuberosity. Uh, I typically have gone away from using large triangles, mainly because at one of my institutions, they don't have a medium. They have a small and a large, and that doesn't really help me with most patients. I, I've, I've made a large towel bump, uh, a, a basically a double the size version of a total knee bump, and that, that has helped me a lot. Uh, I typically will use a midline incision, especially if there's a previous history of a, of a knee replacement. I'll go through the same skin incision. And for me, it's really dealer's choice. If you feel like you need to get to the medial side, it'll be a medial parapetella with a small pocket subvastus lateral or vice versa. It's really versatile. You can do either one. Uh, for me, I do a lot of total joints also. Sometimes with these CR knees where the trochlear box is really posterior, uh, I will not hesitate to uh, remove the polyethylene just to get my 
uh, uh, start point for my wire appropriate. Another thing I do is I, I typically don't move the patella out of the way. I go trans tendinous to get that start point correct because I don't want the extensor mechanism deforming my starting point uh, when it comes to my nail position. Uh, I get provisional reduction, bump wires out of plane for eventual nail fixation, usually at the almost the anterior rim of the articular surface, uh, medial and lateral and in crossing K-wire fashion, uh, bone hooks under the flange, sometimes a shans pin uh, or, or, uh, construct can help you kind of obtain and hold the reduction as you're kind of manipulating and getting provisional stuff. I will use a single pass reamer, typically a 10 and a half or 11 trans tendinous measure and then drop a nine nail up. Um, I will slide the lateral lock plate up uh, and then uh, I will usually literally use a sitting stool, sit at the proximal window at the vastest ridge and make about a four, four to five finger breadth in, uh, incision, uh, about two finger breaths posterior to the vastest ridge. And this is where I'm going to see the plate and center it. So, you know, I'm not depressed when I get a lateral that the plate's off proximally. I want to make sure that it's, it's centered, both distal and proximal, checking on orthogonal views. Uh, I, I put a drill bit distally. I hold proximally with a non-locking drill bit, typically going off the neck. I line up the triple sleeve uh, through from the nailing jig through one of the distal holes. Then I lock using one of the plate locks. Uh, and then I uh, basically fill the distal block. And then, you know, not, not to fill any of these holes, but I will go up the shaft with non-lockers, lockers. lockers and then typically try and get one or two screws up in the next. Here, as you, the difference that you see, I feel like from these x-rays and some of the x-rays that John showed earlier of when we were learning how to figure out how to do this and not fail, remember that every screw hole is, in, is not an obligation. It's, not, it's, it's only an opportunity. We don't want to make this too, too rigid. I typically only will use um, one proximal locking hole now and lock that. This is an older floral. We, we were kind of figuring out how to how to do it and we want to tend it to overfix. Um, and that's kind of the way we do it when it comes to this. Um, this is kind of the overall steps when I'm doing a nail first. Uh, when it comes to plating, it's not that much different. Same setup, same kind of approach process, same kind of revision thing. Um, but this is where one I feel like if I, and I'm an extreme nailer by trade, if I feel like I can't get it right with the nail first, this is where I'm going to slide a, a plate up uh, being cognizant of where my nail might be. Oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll kind of put the starting guide wire in where I think it needs to be so I can kind of uh, put my screws around it. I'll have limited fixation, anterior, posterior with the middle block open. Same way, I'm going to hold the, the plate kind of pro approximately unicortical screws or out of plane screws in the diaphysis with the drill bit up top. Then I will drop the nail. Then I will link the construct and then I'll move up and I'll balance and I'll complete the construct. Uh, I don't know. I, I know. I know. Chris, you you do plate first a lot, and John, you kind of change philosophies. Uh, any anything to add on these that that tips or tricks that you guys have? I typically like linking up the plate uh, just to hold my reduction. And you know, for most of these pre contour plate application, you can shoot a screw anterior and shoot a screw posterior, and then still miss the trajectory of the nail path. And then if you're going to place your screws in the shaft, you can't really go cranial because that you kind of get it into the ismic of the shaft. So I usually put a screw just above the fracture and you have a little bit more play where you can direct that corporal screw. So it's going to miss your final nail application. And I don't tend to always go up and put screws in the neck. That's not something I always do. I know that the audience asked, you know, Rich, what's your screw density preference? And how long are your screws distal through the plate? Are you using all corporal screws in the shaft? Are you using some hybrid fixation? How do you make that? decision and if you're using locking screws or using unicortical or bicortical I, I typically try to stay from stay away from unicortical screws in general um, i know some companies have those uh stubby kind of periprosthetic screws that go in i, I just I, I i don't feel as confident around it um some some in, some uh, companies have a, a locking attachment plate you can get around the nail i think that's ex that's excessive in this in this field that's really for revision stems and things like that in terms of screw density, I think distally near the joint line, you want a you want as much as you can, right? Um, locking it using all locking screws closer to the articular surface or the joint line. But as you're going up the cortex, number one, uh, in these some of these patients, you still have to watch out for golf clubbing. It ha happens less, but you still want to make sure you're not creating deformity when you're putting a non-locker in. My preference is to spread and then do non-locking going up the shaft just to make sure that I'm getting the plate down also. But in those rare instances, or, or I mean, 
common and depends on where you live and how many uh, osteoporotic patients you take care of. You know, I, I won't hesitate to lock in between, but if I do, it will. I will skip more holes. You notice in this fluoro, but as as I get uh, farther and farther away from the fracture site, I'm skipping more holes and making it less and less dense. I think that's that's important. Um, the other thing about uh, another question that came up in the chat was, um, do you need variable angle screws? You don't. I think uh, for those of you who are on who are not in uh, um, uh, as privileged situations as we are in the United States. Um, oftentimes, as long as you're not totally off axis and for all the reps on the calls, please close your eyes. Um, you can you can get locking screws to lock in in variable angle stainless steel plates. Um, sometimes they will cold weld them, but as long as you're not outside of 30 uh, excessively, you can still get them to do that and lock. So um, I don't think it's the end of the world if you're limited, but it's really important. Um, you can still do this for C2 or C3. Um, I've certainly done a nail first in those instances. Um, however, those are the ones where I'm a little more cognizant. If you have a C3 where the trochlea is blown, blown out, that's another one where I say, you know what, maybe this doesn't need a nail. Maybe it needs a dual plate. Or if I can get a nail in and put, put that trochlear cap back on, um, you know, that's one that I might be dialing it in with the plate before placing a nail first if you have to do a little bit uh, on. Um, Dan Schlatter asked the question about a typical tubercle osteotomy. Um, it's insane you asked that question. I was just in Brazil. Um, I'm sorry. I was in India this past December, and the uh, the delayed malunion those cases those surgeons get in India are absolutely incredible. And for them, a big workhorse is an osteotibial tubercle osteotomy coming up. Uh, for us, I think we get everything kind of fresh. I really don't think that's that's uh, necessary, especially because, I, in my opinion, that's going to kind of hinder their rehab a little bit. You have to work it, worry about the extensor mechanism and another thing you have to worry about healing. Uh, so that would be something that for me would be a very you know unique scenario. I'm, you know, never say never, never in our field. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I, I don't think we'll need it in the acute setting. Um, another question from the chat, are you concerned about distal bone resorption underneath the plate long-term? Uh, have you, I haven't seen that. Have you guys seen anything like that? No, not really. I mean, I think there is, you know, a lot of these patients are, you know, again, we highlighted the fact that, you know, we're doing this to you know, mobilize them and, and weight bear them immediately. And so I, I worry less about um, resorption of bone, I think, just by getting them up and, and mobilizing. You know, it is, you know, we talk about dialing in the stiffness of the construct and, and clearly you know, we're making these constructs, you know, extra rigid, uh, but I just don't see it being a, a, a massive um, a massive problem for these uh, for these patients. I, sh I surely haven't seen it. Rich, is there any? Well, I'm going to switch you off uh, really quick. Unless you want to go, you want to run through a case really quick. Yeah, just just real yeah, quick. Yeah. I, I do yeah. I do want to say one thing about the neck thing. Um, we don't know. Uh, we don't know if uh, honestly, uh, one of our friends in Mayo, he had one of uh, these prophylactic ne ne neck uh, things fail in a diabetic renal patient, and you know we we're we're trying to publish that data now. Um, I just do it for my myself right now. I don't I don't have data to back it up in terms of protecting the neck. I just we take care of everything down the line. So I just don't want to kind of get to that point. Another common question that comes up is plate length, nail length, and mismatch. I don't think we have an answer for that yet either. Again, don't make everything the same size. If you're gonna pick one or the other, you still have to balance your principles and not make it too rigid. Um, and just to go through this case real quick, this is for me one of my ideal scenarios. 85-year-old geriatric patient status post fall downstairs. Here's a 3D recons. Very bad injury. She had a puckered skin that was underneath that uh, shaft fragment, which was displaced. Medial comminution. When you pull it out to length, kind of a large zone of injury on the medial side. My goal here was to get her walking up immediately. This is someone that on post-op day one, she uh, yelled at my resident for not making the bed properly after they uh, yelled at her. She, she's a, she's an 85 year old going on 60 year old Italian woman who's still the matriarch in her family. Again, same setup. This is a C uh, C type fracture where we clamped it. AO technique, cannulated screws to fix the joint. Nail first here, plate. And you notice here it's not contoured perfectly, right? I had a non locking screw kind of going down the shaft. I didn't like what it was doing to the shaft proximally at that juncture, so I just held it off the bone with a little bit of a locking screw. Uh, had her weight bearing immediately. These are x-rays at six weeks. 
Uh, and I think Chris is going to talk about this a little bit. And I, I think after I saw your talk at the OTA, Chris, I've been thinking more and more about your plate position in dual plates. The area where I feel like we're, where we've gone wrong in a lot of these isolated lock plates is where the posterior medial corner of the distal femur doesn't heal. And something I've noticed is when we follow these patients for long enough at one year, you see this here, she gets this posterior medial, and this is where I love where our x-ray techs actually shoot a terrible x-ray, where I get to see this posterior medial callus. It's something I really, I saw in nails frequently. I just didn't see a lot of it or it was the last thing to come when it came to isolated nails, isolated plate fixation. And this is something that we see more and more readily with a continual nail plate use. So, you know, just take home points here again, obviously we wanna get our patients up and walking. For me, when I use dual plate construct or dual implant construct, it's gonna be, big medial metaphyseal comminution where you need to get stress over to the medial side. It's really your comfort level and what you're good at. Uh, I typically try and use a midline deep parapatellar, especially if they had a total knee in there. Um, trans tendinous makes your nail placement easier so it doesn't lead you astray. You know, if you're a nailer first or a plater first, I think you have to make sure that you're not making a rigid and you have it balanced. And that's really the most important point when it comes to this. So at this point, I'm going to stop and sh I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Yeah, thanks a lot. We'll turn it over to uh, Chris. It, Rich, is there any, is it mostly the vast majority is for geriatric patients? These are patients who are any role in, in younger patients at all? Um, I, For me, rare, but I we have these sometimes really high energy, high energy uh, patients that come in where I'm not using it more in a classical sense where uh, in geriatric patients, you're trying to get it kind of aligned and then kind of fixed with stability in, in a in younger. I mean, like, you know, I think the last guy I did it on was almost like 44, 45. And for me, I almost use it, the, the uh, techniques as dialing in and helping you get the pieces together and then making it reliable. So I think the philosophy and the principles are the same. And just like, uh, you know, answering Dan Schlattery's question, you just never say never in this area, but I just think it helps us understand it better. And even those patients, I've helped them weight bear earlier, even though they're younger. So I, th I think we still don't know a lot of things and we're still aiming to get there. Awesome. Thanks. Chris, take it away. All right. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, thanks to AO for putting on this webinar. So I'm tasked with uh, making dual plate believers out of all of you. So now this is a traditional case that people are seeing now as a population ages, a 76 year old female with a relatively simplistic supraconal distal femur fracture. And she gets plated, uh, relatively MEPO technique, and relatively good alignment overall. And at three months, um, she has various collapse and failure. And so what have we really gotten for non-union rates for single lateral lock plating? Well, it's kind of varied in the literature if you looked at it, anywhere from 10 to 20%. Our recent series that had a 1,111 patients showed about an 11% non-union rate. So it's still relatively high in comparison to other fractures that we're fixing. So what are the sort of things that we can control and can't control? Well, we can't control patient characteristics and fracture characteristics. And I think this is one of the earlier papers that came out in 2016 that really was eye-opening for a lot of people and said maybe single lateral lock plating isn't the answer for all distal femur fractures. This is a paper out of Houston that showed a 22% early failure rate of the variable angle distal femur locking plates. And so who are these at-risk patients? What does the literature say? Well, for patient comorbidities, things that we can't control, it's things such as increased BMI, diabetes, and smoking, which is relatively the same for most fractures that are problematic. Um, some fracture characteristics that are particularly troublesome are ones with significant medial comminution, which has been found in our paper and other papers alike, and open fractures and ones with vascular injury. So again, very common actors here. What can you control over contra characteristics? Contra characteristics where well, we can manage working length, we can change the metallurgy of the plate, our proximal plate length, and our overall rigidity with our screw density. And so what I mean by that, so, you know, everyone has this optimal working length in their mind, but we don't really know what that optimal working length is for every patient. Uh, I remember, you know, in training, people said it is always four or five holes for every patient, but that, that varies depending on the fraction. We really haven't come to a consensus conclusion. Uh, I think proximal plate length was alluded to in the Ritchie article, which showed at least you know, eight holes proximal to the, the fracture in terms of longer plate lengths tend to be also better. But we have to understand that flexibility is a spectrum, right? So you have this type of fracture with a large zone of medial comminution, and what you want is an accordion type 
motion to occur with your plate application. But what, what you really get is cantilever bending. So you get much more medial sided flexibility as opposed to lateral flexibility. And that sort of eccentric loading can cause some shearing problems. All right, so how do I choose when I plate and when I dual plate, when I nail plate? Uh, oftentimes I look at is it intra-articular. Now, if it's extra-articular, for the most part, you can nail most of these. Obviously, there's some problems if there's uh, you know, a joint placement in there. If it's intra-articular, then the real question is how many interlocks can I get? Can I get two solid interlocks, not in the fracture, not in comminution? And if I can, then you know, I, I, I probably think about nail versus a plate, but if I can't, then I'll just plate it. Um, and then finally, how much medial comminution is and where is the medial comminution? Is it all metaphyseal? Well, if it's metaphyseal, you can choose, you know, plate nail or dual plate. If it's metadiaphyseal, that's when I start to really think about a dual plate versus a nail plate. And if it's truly diaphyseal, that's where I think, you know, diaphyseal femur fractures or things with diaphyseal medial comminution really want a nail. One thing I want to touch on is, you know, when you're dual plating, and I tend to be a lateral plate application person first. There's a lot of challenges to this, and some people will medial plate first to gain, gain their overall alignment and mechanical access. So there's a lot of tricks that people are, are taught uh, early in their careers, and this is the thing that was most commonly taught to me when I was a resident, is you drive a 95-degree wire, and it has to be parallel to the articular block, and if you get that correct, then you've got the alignment of the plate correct. And I've stopped doing this. I think this is very difficult to do to scrutinize the fluoroscopy, make sure that that line is directly parallel to the articular block. I find that incredibly difficult to do, and it makes the plate application a lot more challenging. Now I've gone almost solely to doing the entire plate application on a lateral. So the only thing I look at is a lateral, and I look at the AP last. And so what I'm really looking for is a trochlear groove anteriorly and the Blumenstadt's line posteriorly. And I want those the posterior uh, distal most hole and the anterior distal most hole to be contained within there, such that the, the posterior distal most hole is still contained within Blumenstadt's. That serves two purposes that allows you to put the plate in a proper spot. And it also allows for that screw not to be in out in. If you go too distal, then you start to go in through the, the notch. And so this is what it looks like if you apply the plate just uh, based off the lateral. And you want to make sure that, that the shaft of the plate sits on the anterior one third of the thermal cortex. This is an example just showing you that if you align it correctly on the lateral and you shoot that, and this is just on the far right showing you that the shaft, the plate sits just on the anterior edge of that shaft. Those screws should be aiming from anterior to posterior. So you're tilted because the articular block is tilted 10 degrees. If you're not tilted and those screws are not tilted 10 degrees and you're really gonna ex externally rotate the articular block. And if you apply the plate too distal, you get a couple problems. One problem is you're in out and you're through the notch. And then you, the other problem is that you tend to call, cause this medialization of the articular block because a wider posterior condyle, the wider distal segment is not attached to the proper spot on the plate. This is an, another example that shows you that not only does plate application matter, but also reduction. So if you extend the articular block, you bring the posterior wider condyles more anterior, and then that increases your distance from the shaft to the plate. And so you can do these tricks such as putting locking screws in the shaft so that you don't cause a, a deformity or a golf club deformity when you're applying the plate to the bone. But it's also showing you that you have to really scrutinize your reduction when you're applying this lateral plate. One thing that's commonly overlooked is rotation. So this is us putting on this plate, seeing that the shaft is uh, far away from the plate and, and really analyzing, is there something going on here? So the most common thing that you do is you externally rotate the articular block. And when you do that, uh, you bring the, the plate, the prechondral plate no longer fits. So we reassess our rotational profiles. We look that it's completely different. Obviously, you see much more the lesser trochlear in the other view. We internally rotate that articular block, and you can already see that the, the, the shaft of the bone is much closer to the plate. So you have to be very conscious of not extending the articular block and making sure that your, ro your rotation is righteous. And then all of a sudden, you know, the plate fits okay, and then you're no longer golf clubbing the fracture. So this is the, 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 the brunt of our talk is medial plate application. And that's what, you know, dual plate, uh, dual plate people have the, the most trouble with applying or, or people out in the community maybe have a, a tougher time applying this medial plate. And one of the things is that people have always thought that it's, you know, fearful to be on that medial side that's right near the artery. And I think this article, as long as in addition to the college article has shown that you have quite a bit of distance uh, to, to safely apply that medial plate on the direct medial surface. Now, as you go very, very cranial, so at least 16 to 19 centimeters above the adductor tubercle, then you have to start to bend that plate a little bit anteriorly, but you have quite a bit of distance to go where it's very safe. This is a, an article that was published in JOT that's a technical trick that just shows 
that percutaneous application of medial plate is possible. And we know this because the, the anatomical studies have shown us that it's pretty safe. Now, in this particular article, they made a larger incision cranially. They actually visualized the bone and then applied the plate and then visualized the plate. And this is just an anatomical article showing you that it's safe. Now, one of the other myths was that if you do apply, uh, if you apply dual plates to a distal femur, you obscure the vascular, you, you disrupt the vascular to such a degree that you cause a non-union. And this is, you know, an article that was shown uh, out of HSS that basically showed that the vascular difference between a lateral plate versus a medial plate is about 3%, so 21% to 24%. So you apply lateral plates, 21% decrease in vascularity. You do a dual plate, it's about 24%. So not much of a difference there. Now, I do, uh, uh, our, our monitor shows that uh, there's a lot of torsional and axial stiffness, the most actually with dual plates as opposed to plate, uh, plate nails. And finally, this is how I tend to apply the medial plate. I, I do a percutaneous approach and people say how it's very difficult to bend this plate while well, I use a 3-5 recon plate and it's a very consistent bend. You bend about 30 degrees using a French bender from between plates holes uh, one and two. And then you flip the plate bender around and you apply a gentle curve from plate holes three to six. And this is just a 12 hole plate. And then I increase that distal bend using a couple screwdrivers and increase that uh, concavity to about 50 degrees between plate holes one and three. And then this is, you know, I was just bending this plate freehand and you can see what the profile of that plate looks like. And this is just us showing on a uh, saw one model that it's pretty reliable. Now, this is the contour for a poster medial surface application of a plate. So a little bit different than some of the pre-contour plates that are out there, which are typically more anterior medial. So this is again, the poster medial surface of that distal femur. And the way that I look at that is you're applying an anterior lateral plate. Why would you also apply an anterior medial plate? You want things to be truly 180 degrees from each other or parallel. So this is a real life clinical example of, again, me just using a French better. Again, same bend, plate holes one to three, then a gentle bend from three to six then using a screwdriver between plate holes one and three to bend that 12 hole recon plate to about 50 degrees. And I use the incision from my periarticular, uh, periarticular plate um, or clamp rather. And then I slide this plate just sub um, just using feel. And then I apply a coracle screw distally once I've centered that in the correct spot on the posterior medial surface of that distal femur articular block. And then cranially, cranially I apply a very small incision I locate that plate under fluoroscopy. And, you know, depending on what company you use, I, I just use a tonsil to expand that. And I use, this is a tibial plateau percutaneous aiming bar arm that's used for that set. And you can find the hole located. It's a triple sleeve. And then you apply that uh, inner sleeve in, put the screw in and then put a drill hole through that final outer sleeve. And then you can just make a, a small incision. And this is safe and I've done this, you know, plenty of times. So this is just a case example. It's a 64 year old male. He uh, fell off a ladder, had this comminuted supraconal or distal femur um, fracture. And this is what I got when I was uh, pretty much done laterally plating it. So I applied a mini frag plate, you know, fixed your articular block with some cortical screws. And you can see the significant amount of medial comminution, which made me a little bit worried that this would cause a lot of cantilever bending and eventually fatigue out the plate. And so applied a medial plate, same bend, same posterior medial surface application, all percutaneously done. And, you know, a lot of the thought was if you apply a dual plate, maybe it won't heal. Maybe you won't get a lot of callus. It's too stiff. And this is immediately post-op. This is at three months where you can already see the callus that's forming on the medial side. This is at six months where you see a robust amount of posterior medial callus. And this is um, what you see at one year. So well-healed distal femur fracture. So basically the take-home messages are that it's, it's difficult to predict healing with single implant constructs, but understand that the literature suggested pa patients with increased BMI, open injuries, significant medial comminution, those are all ones that we want to think about empowering our construct and maybe using a dual plate application or a nail plate combination. I think restoring the medial column is incredibly important. You want balanced fixation, as Rich talked about. If you use a single lateral plate and you have no medial cortical buttress and you have a lot of cantilever bending, way too much flexibility on the medial side, and that just increases your chance that the lateral plate will fail over time. I think medial plating can definitely be performed safely with a minimally invasive technique. Uh, there's different techniques out there. I, I tend to use one where I use a percutaneous aiming, aiming arm and I use that guide off label and just find the screw hole. There's other plates or other companies where you can have a, a locking sleeve and they'll just insert into that recon plate and they can just use that as well. And I think you should always consider adjunctive fixation and problematic fracture patterns. 
set for me. Nice, Chris. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Any uh, a quick question for you? So, is sometimes these uh, fractures will have you know, more extended medial comminution. Is there any length or um, any thought to you know like when it's just it's too much? Like the fracture just extends too high. Like you're gonna you know you're using a a more flexible implant instead of a you know a rigid three five small fragment implant something like that. When you say look, it's just you know at this point I'm 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 already gonna maybe think about if I need a separate implant, I'm going to go to more of a nail plate instead of a dual plate because the the length of metaphyseal combination, you know, on the medial side is just too, is too great. Right. And for me, I, I think when you start extending up into the actual true diaphyseal shaft of the femur, when that combination extends that cranially, I, you know, I don't, for me, I know uh, even Carol showed a beautiful example of, you know, bending a large fragment plate and twisting that thing anteriorly. And to me, that's very technically challenging. There's probably very few surgeons who can safely do that on a regular basis. Uh, for me, when it extends diaphyseal, that's when I really start to think about a nail plate combination. When it's solely metaphyseal, I am almost always dual plating them. I'm not uh, nail plating those. And uh, and there's metadiaphyseal, then it's kind of dealer's choice. I tend not to use longer than a 16-hole recon plate. If I can't get it with a 16-hole recon plate, I'm, I'm likely just going to nail plate that. Gotcha. One other question I had, and just a thought is, you know, you showed a nice example, a great video of um, doing that through a minimally invasive uh, approach. And in a few instances, um, where especially sometimes when these are open fractures and there's bone loss anterior laterally as the distal aspect of the of the shaft, you know, exits the skin or, or similarly, I found that there's the only place that I may actually have a read with regard to length alignment rotation is on the medial side. There may be a posterior medial um spike or fragment or something like that that is my kind of key to to dialing everything in so um is that something that you found as well does your does your app does your plate choice or plate application differ in any uh situation that like that or maybe just uh, expand a little bit on you know yeah anytime anytime open or always minimally invasive yeah i i think there's you know there's always never say never right like so i think i, I definitely had a case example where the you know distal shaft or the the um the shaft is extruded out the lateral skin and that entire lateral side is common or half of it's out in the road so you have absolutely no read and the only crisp read that you has on the medial side and i think in that scenario just to restore length alignment it's okay to go on that medial side i think you have to be biologically friendly with all your approaches whenever you're doing that especially when you have an open fracture and those patients are inherently going to have a higher risk of failure anyways, just because the soft tissue destruction is so much more significant. Uh, but I will never be opposed to going and opening that medial side if that's my best read, uh, especially with those open fractures. And in that scenario, I'm not using a recon plate. I'm probably using something a little bit more robust, uh, probably like an LCP plate, but I don't go to a large frag. I usually do like a 3.5 LCP, something small frag. Gotcha, Rich. I'm going to pick your brain and, and flip back to you. Uh, as someone who does a reasonable amount of arthroplasty, um, is is your choice for implants either a nail plate or you know maybe a dual plate such as Chris showed? Is that factor into your thought process to you know with regard to you know someone who may need who already has pre-existing arthritis or may need to be converted later with regard to surgical incisions? I know you said you usually use a midline surgical incision. Um, and make it like a, a subvastus pocket on the lateral side, but maybe talk a little bit about um, that kind of those two hats that you wear, and, and does that affect your in, uh, decision with regard to um, how to fix these? No, I mean the because certainly you can, and this this is the way I tell you know I, some of my friends who are total joint surgeons who are apprehensive about going to the medial side. I tell them that they do it every day, every day that they're in the OR and they do a total knee. You're essentially doing a medial pair of patellar to get into the medial side. And once I convey the data that Chris and I see presented about where your safety is in terms of, yeah, your SFA could be even close, but you're not going that that far back either. Really, for me, if, if I think I'm dual plating, whether it's someone I think I'm going to convert later or someone who already has a knee that would benefit from a dual plate and I can't get anything through like a closed box, I'll do a medial pair of patellar, which is like Chris said. I'll kind of put a home in underneath the kind of the posterior medial junction. And I totally agree with you. Oftentimes that read is not like that either anterior medial or posterior medial kind of like key in. Um, if I need a mini frag to hold it there and then I'll neutralize it either with 
Um, I like using like a three, five distal tibia plate and just making it a little bit flatter. If I have to go higher up, I have used a, um, certain companies have a proximal humerus plate that has a, a bend to get around a deltoid. If you flip that upside down, you can get that anteriorly. It's just a little bit difficult to contour the, the, well, it's the proximal and the proximal humerus plate, but the distal end of, if you flip it upside down, because those companies are usually titanium based. And it's a little bit harder to contour that, but you can get it done. Um, but certainly for me as a guy who does a lot of arthroplasty also, I try, especially in the elderly, I try and keep that midline as much as possible just, just for that reason. Because if it goes out in, in our area, if they see like it's one of our group's cases, it, it usually comes back. No, no, It's like, no, we know who did this. There's a lot of metal in here. It's going back to, you know, to our house. So that, that's why we're always paranoid. I got you. That's good. All right. You got about 10 minutes. I'm going to try to get through maybe a couple of cases. And so we'll just keep this um, uh, relatively quick. And um, so there's a 72 year old female fall from standing, uh, closed injury. Uh, I can't remember exactly. I think there was a largely extra articular fracture. Um, no other significant comorbidity. So Rich, when you, when you look at this, just tell me your, tell me your thought process. Is, a, is this a single implant? Case for you is just a, a dual implant, uh, no bone loss, no other no other abnormalities or, or weird things hiding in this one. Yeah, for me, this this would probably just be a retrograde nail. Um, doesn't Not, doesn't seem too bad. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, this is good generate discussion. Chris, any any other thoughts? Yeah, this, the... this probably this gets a nail pretty much every time for me. I think you probably get at least two, three solid interlocks in there, maybe even four. And uh, it's relatively, I don't really see a, a split. It might be a relatively minor split, but this is, this is one I think you can definitely get away with just a single. So I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause. I'm just going to do one because I'm noticing something now. So I can't see it on the 3Ds because we averages at, it sometimes averages out. On the, on the x-ray, I see a shadow of the spike coming almost all the way down to the level of the lateral the condyle, the femur, and almost exiting there. So that worries me a little bit. So on this coronal, on the coronal slide, on the CT scan, if it looks like that is exiting that low, then this will probably end up also being either, it probably end up being a nail plate just it goes up medially, just because I want a little bit more of a biomechanical advantage. Uh, one company has uh, almost a, a washer plate that you can put there. I think that also could be uh, an option here just for a robust kind of fixation. But if that, if, if what I see on the x-ray is confirmed and I see it kind of exiting that low, then th this will probably be a dual implant for, implant for me. Do you think you need that with the newer iteration of nails that have sort of these advanced options that interlock into the nail? Because that's my question is, even if it's a non-displaced cortical crack, like is it is that really going to be the difference if you're using a nail with a fixed angle construct that you get obliques that you're probably going to have, you know, at least two of those interlocks going through and, and missing that fracture fragment? So, so the thing that, I, I, so I thought the same exact thing until I was at OTA last, last month, because there, there are some companies that are showing now that even with a uh, fixed angle in every hole, that some of their locking screws are backing out. Yep. So I'm still going to be paranoid and I'm going to overfix with balance, of course. Uh, so until that data comes out later, because I don't want to learn the hard way. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of us have always learned the hard way. Um, so I'll, I'll, I always tend to be paranoid. All right, so I'm going to move this along. So yeah, this was actually, um, for me, I don't look at this. There was that extension distally that you mentioned, but it didn't go into the articular surface. And so this was uh, just a, a straight retrograde nail for me. You know, the whole thing's about dual implants potentially, uh, but there, I still think there are there's a role for uh, single implants. And so we see use of a blocking wire just to help, you know, dial in the, uh, the coronal alignment. Uh, and this was, you know, Again, these newer nails that have multiple interlocking options, uh, and this one does have these are fixed angle bolts um, in uh, at least a couple of the more proximal uh, holes. And so, this is my final radiographs fluoroscopically, and then immediate weight bearing uh, for this patient. She healed uh, pretty robustly. So, no, nothing, nothing strange. But I still think there is, you know retrograde nails and lateral lock plates, I think in, in certain scenarios, especially when there's adequate bone quality um, uh, are good. So I'm gonna change this one up a little bit and I'm gonna give one to one of you and then uh, the other one to the other person. So this is an 85 year old 
uh, who's an autoverse pedestrian, um, bilateral closed femur fractures. Uh, she has a, a pretty gnarly open, uh, which ends up being a, a 3B tibia, uh, but we're going to stay away from that. But maybe just, you know, for the time being, that was that was um, debrided uh, and provisionally stabilized. And so she has uh, the right uh, femur that you see the, there, uh, and those are the best radiographs I have for you. Uh, and Rich, you'll get the right. And then on the left, uh, Chris, you get the left. Those are both... Uh, posterior stabilized knees, closed, closed boxes. Um, and so give you a 10 seconds to, to digest here. Rich, again, you're on the right. And then, anatomic right? Anatomic right, correct? Yeah, yes. Yeah, the patient's this, correct. The patient's, <laughs> the patient's right. The, you have the one that has a, the, that larger metaphyseal um, segment. And then Chris has that oblique one on the uh, on the left side. So. That's as much time as you get, Rich. What do you, uh, what do you want to do for that for that one on the right? This is going to be no injury on the distal aspect of the of the right leg, uh, and again, close injury. Patients cleared for uh, whatever you would like to do with them, and we've we've addressed at least provisionally the the distal aspect of the left lower extremity. So every part of me wishes that this patient had an isolated diaphysis in this setting, just because I can do it. If if I had a chance to reasonably use a cephalomedullary nail and, and integrated, that would be ideal. But obviously that fracture goes too distally for me to do that. And then because it's a closed box TKA, this essentially is bought my approach, right? This is, I'm going to, I'm going to do a midline approach. I'm going to go up North. Um, I'm probably going to do an anatomic reduction of the, of that big spike. It looks like it, it wants to kind of come together. Uh, oftentimes here in geriatric bone, even in periprosthetics, I will not lag it, but if I get it pretty close and anatomic, I'll put a cable around it just because, uh, I don't know, maybe I got to go back to basic AO principles course, but these bones, you get a lag screw in, you get two finger breaths tight, and then it just cuts through like butter, like paper. So I, I go to a cable. And then here's something where I'll probably do a lateral lock plate going all over to the vastus ridge, splint in the neck, and then probably either, you know, like a 16, 18 hole distal tibia plate wrapped around the front or going to that kind of proximal humerus plate construct there, uh, we can twist it up proximal. So that, that'll be kind of how I treat the anatomic right. Nice. And uh, Chris, you get a, about a minute and a half, two minutes. How about the, yeah, how I mean, about the side? That's a, it's it, the, there is, a, I believe there was a CT. If you, if you don't know how frequently you're all getting CTs of things around prosthesis, but the, the prosthesis was, was largely stable. Um, yeah, I think, I think most of the time they are. And, and for me, this kind of, this looks like it exits pretty low, caudally immediately. And so this is some, one that I want some added fixation for. Uh, so I'm going to do a dual plate here, a recon plate, uh, anterior lock plate. Um, and I just use a recon plate, let them walk on it, assuming that the 3B, um, they'll eventually let them walk on that. But uh, I would do that. And I, I'm actually okay using lag screws through geriatric bones, specifically because I know it's going to toggle out. And so you're not, uh, you can sort of mix constructs. I know that's not very... Uh, in vogue always, but you can put lag screws in and still have callus that forms and still have a, a relatively bridging construct, even though you're lagging larger segments together to, to provide some cortical stability. Sure. I mean, I think that's, you know, the function of that lag screw is, is largely a clamp for the right. time being to maintain a reduction. And then, you know, as the patient cycles and the bone quality, um, you know, if, if, if poor, the, you know, you are going to get a little bit of callus and convert over to more of a relative stability construct. So, in the interest of time, let me just show you what I did. I, you, you all, you both mentioned things that I think are, that were great because I kind of mixed and matched a little bit of everything. And so for the left side, uh, opened and had an anatomic reduction, used uh, a cable. One of, this is one of those uh, cables where you can only see the little clasp uh, of the cable, but was able to get an anatomic reduction and then used a, an isolated lateral lock plate. Uh, again, you know, I talked to Rich before, I had to kind of dig it, dig around to see find a case where, where I use this in isolation, um, but it, it lined up perfectly. And so I just use a standard uh, lock plate on the on the lateral side and got good fixation. And then on the right side, um, went to a nail plate construct. And in this instance, I actually went plate first, uh, maintained uh, the vast majority of the soft tissue envelope. Uh, someone had mentioned um, unicortical screws. And so in this instance, use some unicortical screws in this system uh, allows these screws to be non-locking until you decide to convert them over, but uh, dialed in my 
uh, reduction with a, a long plate. And then given that this is going to be the patient's only good leg, want to give them something top to bottom. And so um, use an anti-grade nail and brought this top down to protect the proximal femur, uh, as well as um, uh, get the nail down as far as I could below the flange. And here I did have the opportunity to to interlock these constructs. So use a, na play, uh, a plate nail construct, but maybe in not the sense that we had been talking about it with retrograde nails. Um, uh, and so my staple lines always tell the tell the truth with regard to you know how much of an exposure I had. But on the left side, I had an anatomic reduction, which I was able to dial in. And on the right side, uh, everything was all just percutaneous. And so as we dealt with her complex left lower extremity, she was able to weight bear fully on the uh, right lower extremity. And so here are final radiographs uh, taken at I think these are about uh, a year out, um, healed the, the right side uh, remarkably well. And, and the left side, uh, that cable, you know, I don't see a, a notable amount of callus formation uh, at all. And so she did, uh, she ended up doing very well. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, sorry uh, for the, the seizure inducing uh, flow here, um, but I'm going to go back up here to the conclusion. Um, so I would just wrap up by saying uh, dual implant constructs uh, really do for, allow for improved fixation, especially in poor bone quality. You know, we talk about their use in, in short distal segments. Sometimes when there is a posterior stabilized knee uh, or medullary canal is not available uh, because it's maybe a revision implant. Um, plate nail, we saw, you know, top down, bottom up, uh, a way to also uh, mitigate that large area metaphyseal comminution and allow for immediate weight bearing. I think the order of implant Placement is really uh, not as essential as you we think. It's, it, it depends on what you want that implant to do and if you can obtain and maintain the reduction uh, with either one. So I think either can be placed first. Uh, and biology, regardless, can be preserved when applying dual implants, regardless of whether you're doing a plate nail and a dual plate. Uh, and they do, in most instances, allow for immediate uh, or at least earlier weight bearing for, I think, myself as well as um, Dr. Yoon and Dr. Lee. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm two minutes over. I apologize. Uh, but thank you, Rich. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to the AO for uh, putting this on. I know there we tried to maintain uh, all the questions and getting to all those. Hopefully we answered the vast majority of them. These are our emails. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. And with that, thank you all very much. And that's a wrap.